Good morning, everyone. It's so lovely to have you here today. Thank you all for taking the time. I can already see so many lovely messages coming in the chat. It's blooming lovely. Um, so thank you all for taking the time. Uh, today is a real special treat. But before we get going, let's let's do a little bit of uh, logistics and admin. So first things first, uh, I have seen a bunch of lovely messages that have come through only to hosts and panelists uh, right now in the chat which is incredible, uh, but that means only Sir John and I uh, can see your messages. So if you head to your chat feature right now uh, and you switch your chat to everyone instead of hosts and panelists, there's a little toggle with some instructions on screen right now, uh, you'll be able to uh, keep the conversation going with everyone throughout the duration of today's chat. With that said, let's get going and introduce today's guest. And today's our guest is the very respectable, uh, who will be the first person to tell you not to revere him, uh, Sir John Hegarty. He's the uh, co-founder of BBH, Creative Director at the Business of Creativity and the Garage Soho, author, Hall of Famer, the man responsible for the, the line Vorsprung Dirge Technique, alongside many other culture shifting moments. And, 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 and it just goes on. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, it's a pleasure to have this verified legend with us today. Um, businesses need to adapt quicker than ever, adapting at pace and creativity is at the heart of that. And so is Sir John. Uh, Sir John has two things I'd recommend you checking out right now, which are on your screen uh, in the QR codes. So the first is a newsletter and the second is his course, The Business of Creativity, with the next cohort starting on the 29th of April. Uh, both are linked in the QR codes uh, below. Um, I'm just going to turn the game down based on the chat. Uh, so there you go. Um, hopefully that's a little bit better. Uh, today will function purely as a Q&A. Uh, so if you want your questions in, make sure to use the Q&A feature. Today's featured sponsor uh, is Exclaimer. Uh, so Exclaimer are a lovely uh, piece of software which enable you to manage your email signatures centrally. Uh, this is a lovely, lovely uh, thing because it feels like a tiny thing, but the tiny things matter. And the way that I like Exclaimer doing it is two things. Um, the first is this idea that if you've ever tried to change your email signatures across the whole company and get everyone to do it, it's really, really hard. So this solves that. The second thing they enabled you to do is, um, is to integrate your social media posts uh, into your email signature, which is a lovely thing, uh, specifically on Facebook. But it's a really nice way to make sure that your social posts keep on going afterwards. Also, a big thank you to our other sponsors, uh, Frontify, Redgate and Cambridge Martin College. We'll speak more about those in uh, future weeks. Um, looks like the QR codes aren't working, so I'll make sure to send those through afterwards uh, in the follow-up email. That's how we work. Uh, so there we go. With all that said, uh, Sir John, it's a real, real pleasure. Thank you for taking the time today. And uh, can we do the... It's John, it's John by the way. <laughs> yeah. we've, done this, we've, done the, we've done the survey. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. I, I almost texted people to ask, so thank you. Uh, <laughs> but can we do the table stakes uh, question? So, how do you think about creativity as a concept, and why is it important for marketers to embrace it? Well, I, I mean, the first thing about creativity is that we're all creative. So when we talk about this, the trouble that we have is people think it's something else. They think it's something you occasionally do, you, you aren't creative or you are. We are all creative and it's how we express ourselves, how we uh, take in information, how we inform the world about ourselves. So it's fundamental to who we are. That's the first thing. And therefore, you know, and that's why I describe creativity as an expression of self you know that's what you're doing and you know the way you talk the way you dress the way you eat the way you cook the way you live where you go on holiday these are all partly creative decisions yes they're monetary decisions they're conveniences but they are influenced by creativity so it is fundamental to who we are and it's therefore fundamental to business and if you think about it again you know i spent my career talking to companies and some of them would understand it and others would go well occasionally we engage with creativity and of course you say to them well no it's creativity should be center of everything you do and it's how you define yourself and actually starting a business is a creative act you have to have an idea 
What are you going to make? What are you going to do? What are you going to call it? What are you, how are you going to present it? How are you going to talk to people? All these things are driven by creativity. So it's much more, it's, it's, I kind of liken it to breathing. You know, it's how we exist, except it's about our own philosophy and our personality and our character. So creativity is crucial and fundamental to who we are. I love that. I mean, it, it's such a beautiful way of phrasing things. I mean, w with that thought in mind, though, that's still, to me, it feels like, you know, I understand the words you say, but then I go, okay, how do I do it? You know, because an expression of self is 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 quite tricky. So can creativity, I don't know, be taught? You know, can, can folks sort of learn to be creative? Um, or is it do, does one have to go on a journey of self-exploration to be able to find one's creative self uh, based on what you've just said? Well, the first thing, like anything, is understanding it. First of all, understanding that we are creative, uh, that we're all creative, defining it. Because actually, when you ask people to define what they resort to is, is the process of creativity. They talk about kind of, you know, putting things together that you've not seen before and making something else and, you know, challenging you in some way those are the that's the process of creativity the fundamental principle of creativity is as i said is this expression of self and if i you know how many times have you heard an author a filmmaker a painter whatever talking about their new work and they would so often say what i wanted to say was this and that's the expression of self so how you become at ease with that is understand it. You know, oh, I see. That's the definition of creativity. Two types of creativity, which I could talk about. Understand mm -hmm. that. What is it, the foundation of creativity? Understand that. If you understand all these, and they're not difficult. I'm not talking about, you, know, you have to have a PhD. It's not like quantum <laughs> physics. Well, well, <laughs> fuck what that is. I have no idea. <laughs> Even though that explained to me 15 times. You know, it's, it's so core to who you are. And that once you understand all these things, it's easy. Mm. And then you just enjoy it. And, mm. and I think the wonderful thing, I mean, I'm very lucky. I went to art school, art school to design school, and then into advertising. So in a way, I've lived my life in this kind of, or my adult life in this kind of work. And I, I sort of understand why people can feel hesitant about it, because you're made in some ways to feel hesitant about it. it, it you know, something will keep you out as opposed to embrace you. And creativity is about embracing you. It's about bringing you in. It's about getting you to understand more about yourself. So not only, I mean, if you, sorry, this is a, this is a great plug for the business of creativity, by the way, advertising. <laughs> I should be a lad for it, shouldn't I? But <laughs> one of the things that I really loved about doing this course, uh, writing it, is that it's fantastic for business, fantastic for people in the business. But also I think people come away from it going, oh, I really feel much better about myself because we talk about how you lead a creative life. And I'm not saying, you know, about going to a gallery or going to an opening of a show or going to the theatre, just every day. And it's a bit like, again, somebody who, who practices yoga. You know, they do it because it's not just they do it an hour a week or two hours, whatever it might be. They do it to feel better. And I think once you understand creativity once you understand how it impacts on your life or well, you'll feel much better about life i love that I, I think we have these moments um with our sessions so regularly where um we come in and, and and we kind of take a lot of the fear out of things and and you know everything you've spoken about already sort of speaks to inclusivity um but it also just speaks to relaxing just a little bit which is a lovely way to end yeah. the session you know which is just really 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 quite lovely um yeah. It's a therapy. Oh, it's a therapy. Yeah. I love that. Um, in, in your book, um, I wanted to pick up on this because this idea of an expression of self, then um, in your book, which I just had lying about, um, then, <laughs> then <laughs> um, you, you spoke about fearlessness as, as, as yep. something that feels important to you as part of creativity. And I wanted to when I read that, I was interested whether that's an expression of your own self, whether you are a fearless, fearlessness, a fearless person, or whether you feel like it's a necessary ingredient to creativity. And indeed, if it is a necessary ingredient to creativity, um, whether one can cultivate that as an attitude. 
Well, I, I think when I talk about fearlessness, I, I, you know, there are lots of different types of creativity. There's, there, there's, there's applied and there's pure and that. We, we, we don't need to go into that now. The, the course goes into that. But when you're working in the communications industry, um, what you're in an incredibly competitive environment. You're trying to get your message to stand out against somebody else's message. You've got to create something that is going to be noticed. You've got to create something that people are going to resonate with. And you, you can't afford to be just nice. Mm -hmm. You can't afford to be, yeah, that's kind of good. I quite like that. That's okay. Because, you know, I mean, I, I don't know who counts these things, but apparently we're exposed to something like, 8,000 marketing messages a day. God knows how. I mean, I've, I've just got up. Am I, I, I don't know how. I should be up to about 1,000 already. I don't know how <laughs> that happened. I don't know. But whatever, you know, how you measure those things. But whatever we, we know, we're, we're exposed to a huge amount of uh, uh, messaging in whatever, in whatever form. This is the kind of world we live in. So therefore, you've got to create work that is going to stand out. Because if it isn't standing out, go home now, you know. Pack up, pack your bags, go home, make yourself a nice cup of coffee and, and put your legs up, you know, but you're not going to go. So, and then to do that, you really have to challenge yourself and you have to create something new every day. You know, if you're, and I talk about this a bit, but if you're in certain creative industries, you can go on repeating yourself. You know, I mean, Mick Jagger goes around the world singing Jumping Jack Flash and I mean, they wrote it in 1966 and, you know, but he can still go on stage today and, you know, 30,000 people will turn up and applaud him for it. Well, you know, I couldn't pull out some old ad I had done in 1966 to go, this is the answer. So you, you're in a business where you've got to come in every day and have a new idea. And that idea really can't be like yesterday's idea. You know, there isn't a formula to it. There are principles behind it, but there isn't a formula. So fearlessness becomes crucial to the maintenance of your career that you've got to keep challenging yourself you've got to keep going i've got to, you know i did that fine that was it you know i i can't do that again tomorrow i can't walk into somebody else and say you know i i i, I did voice from go technique and now i you, oh you're italian so i'm going to give you an italian end line and that you know <laughs> Hold on, John. You did that for <laughs> Audi. You can't go on doing that. So you've got to have this sense of you're creating something different every day. And that's very, very challenging. And I talk a lot about how you can make that exciting as opposed to just challenging. But fearlessness is a part of that. And I think if you look at, you know, if you look at great art, you know, you look at someone like Picasso. I mean, let's not compare ourselves to Picasso. <laughs> Picasso, but he was a genius. Um, it, it, you know, he just said, right, I've done cubism. You know, he could have gone on doing cubism for all his life, really, and he'd done very well with it. He just said, no, I've got to move on. I've got to move on. I've got to keep moving on. And, you know, if you read his, 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 his biography, you, you'll see that's what he had to do. He had to challenge himself. And he had to go, I'm just going to paint a picture, and it's called Dora Mar, and the eye is up here, the nose is down here, the head's like that. And people, people maybe they're just going to laugh at me. But he didn't know. He said, I want to change the way you look at a picture. So his fearlessness was there. And you see it in, in lots of other things. You see it in, in film directors. You know, they make a movie and, you know, they've got to move on from that movie to the next one. They've got to keep going forward. And that sense of fearlessness is fundamentally important. I love that. We've already got uh, Carly in the chat saying, I was once described by my boss as not creative at all, which has haunted me ever since. I think today I might finally help me let that go, uh, which is... <laughs> well, uh, Carly, you, 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 whoever said that to you, I think that is truly, truly appalling, absolutely appalling. You know, I, I, just to say that and go back to that, look, it's like we can all sing, okay? Everybody mm. can sing. Now, I can promise you, you do not want to hear me sing. <laughs> but I could if I went to singing classes, sing better. So to somebody say to you, you're not creative, is the most stupid, it's, it's their stupidity. So, you know, you're right, they're wrong. I love that. Thank you very much. I, I think that's that's set the world to right uh, and hopefully uh, yeah, Carl's good. world to right as well. Um, with that thought in mind, when you were sort of speaking about pushing yourself forward every day, I, I'm interested because I, I heard a story about you speaking about pitching the idea of Flat Eric uh, three times 
um, and, and sort of going back with the same idea. And, and I think in the story, you kind of said that eventually they kind of just got wound down and sort of said, yeah, all right, let's do it type of thing. Um, but, you know, I, I'm interested in, in that thing about like when you keep on moving forward versus when you decide to sort of stick on an idea and, and sort of, be, uh, you know, sort of say, this is the one, you know, and, and how you know basically that a creative idea is the one that is worth keep on pushing and, and keep on going and, 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 you know, keep on going because like you couldn't have known known presumably, but you, you must have had something within you uh, that, that must have, yeah. you keep on pushing that forward. It's a very, it's a really interesting question that because I, I, I think it's, again, if you're leading and I don't, I'm not talking like a monk, <laughs> you're <laughs> leading a creative life. And if you're aware, sensitive to things, see things, watch things, look at things, you kind of develop a sense, uh, a sense of kind of what will and what won't work. It's not 100% because this is the wonderful thing about it, that nobody knows that uh, great line from, from William Goldman's book, one of the great screenwriters, you know, in Hollywood, nobody really knows, you know, they will guess. But you develop a sort of sixth sense for things. And it's about excitement. But again, I have my little formula. I do a triangle for how I think about an idea. And my triangle, which I will give to you, is, is, is at the very, very top. Um, is it memorable? Because if it's not memorable, as I've said before, go home now. You know, just go home. You've forgotten. You, you've failed. Then at the other tip, is it motivating? And you stop me. Oh, that's interesting. And then at the other end, and this is absolutely crucial, is it truthful? Because great creativity is built on truth. All right. It, it isn't a fabrication. I mean, oh, yes, you can fabricate. Of course you can. But it's built on truth. And if you've got this kind of triangle of assessment, you can kind of navigate things and you can go, oh, I see, that works on that level. And it, it, it challenges you. But with that, I, I just felt, I mean, people did say to me in the agency, John, have you gone mad? Because, you know, we were used to creating <laughs> these heroes for, for Levi's that were kind of chiseled and handsome and, you know, Brad Pitt, for heaven's sake, we had one of them. And, um, and I just felt that a kind of, a character that challenged the way you felt about heroes and partnership and things like that um, could be really, really interesting. And uh, it could it could capture people's imagination. And uh, I just saw one of your questions here, but is it truthful? Yes, it was truthful. It, 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 we, were, we were talking about, within that, the brief was a new kind of relationship. Instead of it being a single hero, what we should do is have a relationship because everybody felt that would be quite good. And so we, we kind of talked about Jack Kerouac on the road and stuff like that. And I thought that was great. And that's how I presented the idea. I said, it's, you know, to Levi's, it's Jack Kerouac on the road, about the relationship between these two people. And, um, you know, and, and they were getting excited. Oh, great, Kerouac on the road. We really love it. And I just said, there's just one thing I haven't told you. And um, they said, what's that? Well, one of them is a fluffy yellow puppet. And they, were, they did think I'd gone mad as well. Right? And I explained it and I said, what I'm trying to do is get you to think about relationships and about how they work. So that was its truth. It was a truth going to find a way of exposing a different kind of relationship and, uh, uh, and that they're unique, like this is a unique relationship. And that, that, that was at the foundation of it. And eventually they were lovely. They, they, they were a great client and they, they turned it down the first time. I went back the second time and said, look, I really think you've got to think about this. And I did some extra work on it. And they went, no, 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 John, we just, no, 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 we can't. No, no. And then I went back the third time and, and <laughs> I think they just went, oh God, he's coming back with that bloody idea of that. Oh, that's very hard. <laughs> Jeez. Right. And um, I, I got them to buy it and they were brilliant. And it was a phenomenal success. My great regret with it, and I always say, was you always have a great regret with them. I wanted them to also buy like the back cover of, um, of Vogue and the back cover of GQ and, and just have Flat Eric on the back cover instead of it being Armani. 
you know, these black <laughs> area. I, I just thought that would have been hilarious, you know, posing like some sort of male model. Um, uh, but it, it didn't happen. And that's again about how you use the media, because yeah. it would have been brilliant, wouldn't it? You know, it's again how media infects an idea. And it's one of the things that we've forgotten um, in the digital age. We, we've sort of forgotten how you know, the medium is the message and media is fundamentally important, which is why I think Banksy is such an amazing artist. And, and you know, and he's used, you know, the outside, he's used walls as his media. And if he'd just done everything on a canvas in a gallery, he wouldn't be the same artist, would he? No, so I, it's just a demonstration of how media is fundamentally important. I, I'd love that. And uh, there's so much that, that comes to mind. I mean, the one the one that does sort of strike me is uh, combining your thoughts about the media, so sort of like the TikTok generation and and, and and stuff like that, with your idea of truthfulness and the idea that mm. sort of TikTok is creating thousands of cultures uh, in in any one sort of day, any week period, and and any month. Uh, I would assume in a slightly different way to what happened sort of 20, 30 years ago, where you would have a cultural moment which could live for two or three months, etc. Is it harder to be truthfully creative these days, or do you need to go back to that that sort of human sort of truth uh, every time uh, to be able to still sort of be relevant? Yeah. Well, the, the first, I, I always say principles remain, but practices change, and um, and I think you have to kind of work out how you're going to use media, what you're going to do with it, the part it plays, what it's good at what it's not good at, you know. And I don't think we have those conversations enough about, yep, TikTok is great, it, but, but what's it really, what it's really good at is this, mm. understanding that and understanding then how I should use it and what part it should play in my marketing program. And I, 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 I think actually TikTok is, you know, all these new media that we've got are, are, are fantastic. I think what's failing to happen is people understanding how best to use them and how they play a part in a broader wider spectrum of, of their campaign and as i say you, you somewhere in the somewhere you've got to say how am i going to how am i going to create a dialogue with a mass audience in some shape or form where do i start the debate where do i start a point of view about my company, my product, my service, whatever it might be. How do I do it? And then what other elements of that do I use to keep that conversation going? And I think if you, there isn't enough conversation around that of people, this is how I did it. This is how you did it. This is how we, because we always use example. Example is fundamentally important to how we learn. And there aren't enough examples out there of people saying actually this is how we did it and it worked because of that kind of product and we were talking to that kind of audience then we went into a broadcast scenario and how you define broadcast is entirely up to you um, uh, and this is how we built the campaign and i don't see enough of that uh, and as i say that's how you learn you know we learn actually by copying you know and it, you know when you go to art school you copy you go in and you, you look at artists and you copy what they do and you go, well, that's how they did that. And then you go on and then you do your own thing. You develop your own style. It, it, you know, it's like if you've watched, you know, documentary about the Beatles, how they, how they just played other people's songs. You talk about the Rolling Stones. They learned how, you know, Muddy Waters played his guitar. They learned it and learned it. And then they went, oh, right, now I've got that. Now I develop my style. But what they were doing was they, was, they were learning from what had gone before or what was happening around them, whatever, and then taking it into their own world. And I think today we don't have enough of that sort of learning going on uh, yes. of experience. And I think it's, it's crucial. And if you don't do that, you're not going to grow. You're not going to say, well, that was very good what they did and that's how they've done it. Uh, yeah. And I, I think it's by example that we, we grow and that we learn crucial it isn't copying it's fundamental you know it's how we how we learn as i say 100 percent. so who are you who are you learning from at the moment who, who's, who I, the I, well i yeah it's a good question i i spend most of my time thinking uh, you know i try and behave i mean it sounds stupid of course <laughs> i think of myself as the audience i don't think of myself as within an industry 
Mm-hmm. I think of myself as the what do I like? What do I like watching? What do I like seeing? What do I like reading? What, where do I go? Where am I getting my influences? I don't look at advertising. I, I don't, you know, I used to say I work in advertising, I don't live in advertising. And I think what you're fundamentally doing is you're bringing the outside world into your world and then you're reflecting that back out again. So, you know, I always said when I was, you know, writing and working, I was an art director, but I became more of a writer, I suppose, in the end. Uh, I, I was reflecting the broader culture. I was trying to see and read as much as I could possibly read and, and bring that into my work. I didn't want to create work that looked like advertising. I just didn't. I didn't because I didn't like most advertising. I think most advertising is crap. And 90% of it is shit. I mean, you'd want to copy that. I mean, for God's sake, you know, I'd much rather go and see a great movie or go and see a great bit of television or go and see a great play and see how they wrote or read poetry or listen to Leonard Cohen, how he writes. You know, what an inspiring way to write if you're thinking about writing copy. Listen to Leonard Cohen, you know, listen to Nick Cave. Uh, you'll learn more from that. Or, you know, one of the best books I, I, I mentioned in, if you're in the advertising industry to read, of course, my two are just absolutely brilliant. Of course, <laughs> that, but, uh, is William Goldman, who is one of the great screenwriters. And you will learn more from William Goldman about how to write for video, film, or whatever it is you're doing than you will from a book on advertising. But he writes about film. He doesn't mention advertising once. Um, but he talks about how you write for a visual medium. And I I think it's things like that that you have to do. You know, as I said, I I worked in advertising. I didn't live in advertising. And you see people who just get wound into an industry and and they can't see beyond it and outside it. And of course, the people they're talking to, they don't think like that. They, they, They just look at good stuff. They're fascinated by what's interesting, what's distinctive, what's daring, what's different. And you can be part of that, or you can live in a silly world called advertising. Who wants to, you know, why do that? It, it's so true. I, I was listening this morning to um, The Rest is Entertainment, which is a fabulous podcast. Um, yeah. And they were speaking about Channel 5, and uh, they were speaking about the documentaries which Channel 5 make. And it's it's not like, you know, high high art sort of stuff. But mm. the thing that they sort of say is, you know, they've made four documentaries about air fryers. Because that's the stuff that you know people <laughs> people are actually yeah, yeah. thinking about, you know, and actually care about. And, and make it funny, yeah, you know, make it funny, you know. That's, that's the it. other thing too. Well, I, I love that, and I, I know that we've got Dave Harlan uh, watching in today, who's a very funny man, uh, who I definitely recommend uh, people take in his work uh, for inspiration. Um, but there's there's a quote that I, I remember hearing you speak about, which was if. Uh, if they're not smiling, they're not. Then they're not buying. And um, I wanted to loop this into the idea of pitching in. So um, there's folks um, who will be watching in today who have to pitch in the idea of a creative idea to their their relative uh, stakeholders. And uh, we were having this chat last week with Tom Roach and, and Grace Kite about, um, you know, there probably is enough evidence in marketing now to convince or, or at least show what to do to, to, to almost anyone about anything. But the thing that um, is missing quite often is this sense of emotion in the pitch, you know, uh, a fear, a laugh or, or whatever it may be. And I was interested in your, your gauge on, on how one uh, approaches pitches and infusing emotion into these pitches and knowing mm. which emotion is the right one to pick. Because I think this is something that, we can show stats and we can show graphs all day long, but I love this idea that you sort of speak to emotion. So like, I wondered if you have any pitching stories where you could sort of speak to this emotion. <laughs> well, I, I always, that when we were pitching, when we started BBH, we, we refused to do speculative creative pitches. We pitched, um, we wouldn't do speculative creative pitches because we felt we were giving away the thing that was most valuable, the thing that we, valued beyond anything else so in that period of time and it it sort of was kind of you know first 20 years of the agency and I'll, I'll say why we changed it but when we pitched what what you're trying to do in a pitch is you're trying to kind of capture your client's imagination you're trying to get them to understand 
what the future could be like. And we talked a lot about strategically getting things right. And that was the brilliance of someone like, say, John Barth, who was a brilliant, brilliant planner. And we said, first thing, you've got to get your strategy right, because that's the foundation upon which everything is built. Once you've got that right, then you can start doing great creative work. And that's when I would come in and I would have to talk about a vision for the future. Mm -hmm. This is how I see where you could go. These are the kind of things that I want to do. And the idea of pitch isn't to show somebody a piece of work. The idea of a pitch is to get that client walking out feeling great. Mm -hmm. That's that's the answer. Now, everybody thinks you do it with a piece of work. Well, the trouble with a piece of work is they look at it and they go, well, I don't know. I don't like green. You didn't know that, did you? You know, <laughs> I don't fucking know they don't like green. Who told me? Why didn't you find out? <laughs> and so when you reduce everything down to kind of the practicalities, you, list, you miss the bigger picture. And the idea of a pitch is to make a client feel wow. These are truly, truly talented people. I really like talking to them. I could have a fabulous conversation with them. But God, do they make me feel excited about tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, then that's how you win the pitch. And I, I think if you can't do that, then you know, you know, you're reduced to doing what everybody else does. Now, we did change and we started doing Spectrum Creative Work because as the business became global, we couldn't have everybody in the same room. And, and we had to then start showing a piece of work. But I tried to keep it, instead of showing the actual work, what I tried to do is create a video of this is what you will feel like. This is what we're saying. This is the point of view we have. And give them something to walk away with that they could put into, a, in those days, a cassette recorder. And... <laughs> play and go wow i like that you know that that makes me feel great so but it didn't change you're still trying to sell the future you're trying to sell a future that's exciting that's full of opportunity and if you can convince a client that that's what you fundamentally believe in and that you have the answer to that you'll win the business but if you just reduce it down to here's a piece of work i'm sure that they don't know how to judge it you know, how often do they judge a script? How often do they, you know, look at a piece of advertising and go, oh, you know, I would have bought that or wouldn't have bought that? Uh, they don't know. So you've got to remember that. I love that. Well, um, thank you. You know, uh, we've got Dan saying, just got goosebumps in, in the chat oh. here. So, so. <laughs> um, folks, we, we've got uh, 14 open questions in the Q&A right now. Um, the thing that I'd encourage you to do is give a thumbs up to any questions that you'd love us to prioritize uh, just so we can make sure that, that that we get to those as well uh, we've got sophie in the chat as well saying absolute gold uh from oh, Sir thank you sophie <laughs> <laughs> um I, I i wanted to follow up very quickly on, on that and it only needs to be a short answer if if um if possible but one thing that I've struggled with as a marketer is I've sold very well to the initial stakeholder who I happen to be in the room with, but then I haven't necessarily been able to pass things up the line. And I guess in the situation for marketers watching in today, you know, as you've said, you know, folks are distributed around the world. They don't have to take that sense of excitement and pass it up the line. Have you ever, well, presumably you've experienced that, but, um, have you ever found a, a neat solution for that at all? Uh, this is a very personal problem. I'm, I'm getting free consultancy. <laughs> That's the right, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's a very good question, that actually, because I do remember quite early on in my career, I realized that, you know, I thought when I sold the client, yeah, that was it. You know, that was it. So I hadn't quite realized that they had to take the idea themselves and sell it within the company. And that, you know, it was an awakening I had, an epiphany of saying, oh, my God, I've got to. So the way you do that is I think, again, it goes back to my thing about you've got to think about that person now selling the idea within the company. What are they going to say? What tools are you giving them to say, this is why we should do that? This is what the competition are doing. This is the opportunity. So you've got to give them the tools, the phrases, the, the, the neat arguments, because they have got to take it and go, right, you know, I'm going to take, show it to my, you know, financial director or who's going to release the funds or I've got to show it to the chairman. So you've got to think about how they sell that idea within the company. Mm 
And, and there are a million ways of doing that, but you, within your argument to them has got to be the argument that they are going to take to everybody else. So it's got to have some foundation to it that actually is replicable. They've got to be able to take it and do it again. And, um, you know, sometimes that is very, very difficult. Sometimes, you know, people are having to kind of sell something that can be hard. But you give, you give them all the tools. Competitive marketplace, we're losing market share, um, we're losing it to these people. Give them the simple narrative that they take and say, and here's the solution to it. And then I think, one, you'll get a fan from that particular client, but actually will help them sell within the company, which is crucially, crucially important. It really, really is. Yeah. Love that. Thank you very much. Well, you know, we're going to go and do that now. So thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> dead helpful. Let's um let's make sure we take some questions from the community because I'm I'm interested yeah. in a bunch of things, but the most important thing is is the folks watching in today. Um and when I encourage the thumbs up, then there was a, an explosion of thumbs up uh, to this question from from Rob, uh, who says, uh, "What was your uh, what was your least effective but most creative ad ever?" Uh, what was wrong with it and why didn't it work? <clears throat> well, now, you see, I think I don't dwell on failure. I, I, you see, look, I just said, when you doing what you're doing, working in the world you're in, you've got to come in every day and have a new idea. That idea can't be like yesterday. If you dwell on failure, you'll suddenly go, oh, that didn't work. Oh, why didn't that work? Oh, gosh. And it'll begin to inhibit you. And so, oh, I better not do that. Oh, that last thing I did was very, very different and it didn't work. Yeah, yeah, it's going to happen. You know, Tar every film Tarantino's made hasn't been a huge success. Mm -hmm. You know, it isn't. And, and you just have to accept that it's going to be like that. But if you start going back and looking at failure, what was it? It was creative, but it didn't work. It, you'll get yourself into a complete mire. Do not do it. Fine. If you're, if you're researching a new drug, you need to kind of work out what failed, what didn't fail. You are doing something quite different. You are creating something new every day. And yes, some things are going to go wrong. Some things aren't going to work. Put it behind you. Move on. And remember, be daring. Be fearless. <laughs> because if you don't, it's all over. You know, you'll start repeating yourself. Your career will go into decline. And then, you know, people will say, no, nah, that John, he's, he's lost it, really. So you've got to keep challenging. So that's the way I answer that question. Perfect. I love it. And, and it speaks to um, the themes of what you've spoken about today already with your first answer about keeping on moving forward, the fearlessness that we've spoken about. Um, it's almost like you're a consistent human being, uh, John, who, who shows up as yourself, uh, almost like it. Um, that's a, a fabulous uh, answer. Um, what happens in the Q&A now is that we'll end up ping-ponging between a lot of different topics. So I hope you don't mind that. But, um, yeah, it's, sure. It's, Anything. Uh, um, so the next question comes from Anonymous, who asks, uh, which brands or companies do you think are excelling at their creative campaigns uh, right now? Well, that actually is a very pertinent and a very good question. I think very, very few. Um, uh, I, I was a great fan of, and it's now about five, six years old now, Oakley, uh, the oat milk. And I think they had done a brilliant, brilliant job at building a kind of brand in a, in a very, very ordinary market. Um, you know, oat milk, I mean, but they turned it into something exciting. And they it, it went back to my thing of, don't 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 just build a brand, build a movement. And what they had done is built a movement around oat milk, which is you know uh, uh, the first milk for humans. Um, and you know milk is fine for cows, but not you. And it was just brilliant. It was funny. Uh, they used broadcast media, of course, because they were talking to the world. But that was obvious. But they did it with humour. It was brilliant through the line thinking. I I thought it was great. I, I still love it when Marmite do what they do. Um, but I, I, see, I see very little today. I see very little advertising that stands up for something and has a point of view and is trying to change the way you feel or think. Because that's what great advertising does. You know, it changes the way you feel or think and it thinks of itself 
as a movement. If you go right back into the history of advertising and look at the Volkswagen advertising of the 60s, it was changing your point of view about cars. They didn't have to be big. They didn't have to change every year. You know, you could think, think small. Uh, not think big or, you know, whatever. And this, look at Nike, you know, just do it. It was a kind of, you know, it wasn't just selling you a running shoe. It was selling you a way of living, a way of being. And I think advertising as its best does that. And I think it's a little of that at the moment uh, of people really wanting to go out and become a part of culture. As if you're a part of culture, you become more valuable and uh, you become more famous and more famous means you can charge more and do all the things that a brand wants to do. And I see very few brands doing that today, apart from the odd ones I've, I've mentioned. Mm -hmm. Very few. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate that answer. And I think it's it's an interesting thing. Somebody said, so you buy Marmite regularly. No, I hate it. <laughs> I, I am the hater of Marmite. But I love, I adore their campaign. The fact that they're talking to people who actually don't buy it. Isn't that brilliant? It's genius. <laughs> I love that. We've got, yes, so John, in capital yeah. letters here from Tia. <laughs> which is, which is yeah. uh, fabulous. Yeah. Um, and once again, it sort of speaks to the um, the fearlessness fearlessness point. I think um, again, I'm, I'm placing myself in the shoes of, well, I, I'm projecting myself here rather than speaking for marketing in general. But uh, I, I think one operates in a in a field of sometimes fearful of negative outcomes rather than uh, mm. imagining the positive outcome. Um, yeah. And and you've sort of spoken about that with your. Um, you know, sort of selling the future as well with the pitch and stuff like that. And, you, you, and creativity is about positivity. It really is. You know, I, I, I say all great creative people are optimists. I mean, they might look miserable because it's the, it's the 448th idea that hasn't worked. But deep down, they're optimists because you genuinely believe that you're going to change the world with this idea. You, 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 and you have that, even though you know it's probably not going to get bought. You know, you know, one in 20 ideas get made or I don't know what. Thing. But you have to remain an optimist. You know, pessimism kills creativity and optimism expands it. It drives it. You know, I love that. Do you, I, I want to just ask you as, as someone who isn't always naturally optimistic. Is that something that's just part of you? Or have you have, what keeps you optimistic when you're in, in, in the ad space? Because it's easy yeah. to let cynicism, I of think, course, yeah. creep in. So how well, do you do that? I don't know. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's genetic. Maybe I don't. I, I'm just, I, I was I, I was kind of born with that. Look on, look on the, the, the positive rather than the negative. You know, and I, I, you know, um, you, you can look at anything and see the negative and don't surround yourself with negative people. Get rid of them. Get yeah. rid of them. They, they are, they will drag you down. They'll drag your thinking down. They'll drag your, your optimism down. Get rid of them yeah. because nobody solved anything by being negative. Yeah. You solve things by being positive. And that's what you're trying to do all the time. Positivity. Mm -hmm. And I think you've just got to, you know, and I read great stuff, be inspired by great things. You know, I say, you know, if you read shit, you'll think shit and you'll create shit. So read great stuff, be inspired. And, and it, it begins like everything in life. It rubs off. Yeah. It just rubs off. If you if you surround yourself with people who are interesting and distinctive and funny and it'll it'll affect you. Absolutely. Um, if you surround yourself with the opposite, that'll happen. I, I love that. Um, we've we've got uh, Mel in, in the chat here saying, this is so cute, topping up my positivity tank. And um, Mel, as an example of a human being who um, who exudes uh, humor and, and just loveliness, um, I, I right. saw her last week and uh, I left with a twinkle in my eye and a smile on my face. And, and this is um, exactly what it's all about. So thank you. Uh, that's a, a real burst of positivity. Uh, so thank you. Um, Let's let's take the next one from uh, Catherine. So uh, Catherine says, uh, "Does John uh, not Sir John? So uh, she's acknowledged <laughs> the, the, the 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 appropriate level of formality. Good. Uh, Good. <laughs> have any preferred techniques or processes to invoke creative thought when he's feeling creatively stuck? Well, um, I, I mean, obviously, going out for a walk." is is fantastic but the thing that i i used to do is i used to just go let's just have a completely stupid idea let's 
just have a completely barking mad idea, <laughs> make it funny, and then, and then start talking about it. And it will relieve the kind of, you know, trauma around trying to come up with an idea. And, mm -hmm. and if you do that, you, you'll, you'll kind of, you'll relax and you'll have some fun and, 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 and all of a sudden other things will come to mind. But just have it so completely stupid, just and, and write it down, put it up on the board, you know. And, and somebody will come in, look at it and go, is that, wait a minute, that reminds me, or whatever, but, you know. And you'll be surprised how it helps. And we used to do that all the time. And that, in, in a funny way, going back to flat area, everybody thought actually what I had done with that, what I was doing with that was coming up with a company to get people thinking about something else. And of course, with that, I was absolutely serious. But I think if you do that, you know, you, 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 you kind of, it, it, it relaxes everybody else because that's a really fucking stupid idea. If you have a really stupid idea, I can also have a completely stupid idea. And out of those stupid ideas, can come absolute genius and you think why not why don't we do that why don't we challenge that but i think the other thing too is being constantly connected to the world you know reading stuff looking at things reading things that other people don't read um you know just just feed you feed you stuff and that feeding that's why i say don't walk around with these things on don't walk around you know because you know when you're going out for a walk take your headphones off and look around you, inspiration's everywhere. Just, you know, you just need to notice it, just need to absorb it. But I do start with, let's do, let's do something completely bloody stupid. And the other thing too is, of course, juxtaposition. You know, you juxtapose one thing with something else that shouldn't be together. You know, and I always tell this story, and it was when I was at art school, and we're, we're very early on, and we're in painting, we're doing painting, and you knew somebody was going to ask this. You, did, you didn't want to be the one to ask him. You go, oh, God, no, I'm going to be that. I'm going to be that stupid. And somebody always says to the lecturer, said, oh, tell me, said, you know, when you paint black, how do you make it really black, thinking they were going to say, oh, well, you put blue into it or you add green. And I always remember the wonderful teacher just looked at this fellow student rather witheringly and just said, put it next to white. You know, and, and that was a complete lesson in creativity, is juxtapose opposites. And then suddenly you go, yes, you know, most of Monty Python is juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they, 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 you know, they, they, the, if you ever watch the, the, the poets and, and uh, philosophers football match, I mean, it's the one, one of the, it's on, you can watch it on, on YouTube. Go watch it, the Poet and Philosopher's Football Match. And it's basically a football match, except all the players are Aristotle and Wordsworth and kind of that. And it's just so funny. I mean, it's yeah. just instantly funny. And it's just a coin. <laughs> and of course, you know, but it's just a wonderful juxtaposition. So juxtaposition is one thing. That's, you know, that's why, you know, get a very tall man and a very short man or get a very large man and a very small man, whatever, or a large woman and a small woman, or, you know, or, you know, have a black woman and a, and a, a pale woman or whatever it might be. And all of a sudden you've got, oh, why are they so different? And the brain is trying to kind of work it out. The brain is trying, why are they? So the brain is paying attention. And that's uh, what you're trying to get the brain to do. There are lots of little techniques, but go for a walk. Go for a walk. <laughs> a, I, I always a, say to people, you know, I did my best thinking uh, when I wasn't thinking. That's the other thing. It's uh, it's the cliche thing, isn't it? That the uh, you, you have your best thoughts in the shower, isn't it? And and um, yeah, exactly, yeah. You spend a lot of time in the shower, you get shriveled up, but you know, <laughs> yeah. you have great ideas. Idea. Yeah, it's you, great ideas. <laughs> quick, write it down. You want a wet yeah. pen? Don't you write that down. <laughs> I yeah. love that. Um, let, let's take the next one from Martin, who is himself an, an Effie award-winning uh, marketer. Um, so Martin. Um, I think might be poking the bear here somewhat um, by asking the question, should creative processes be intuitive or data-driven? Um, well, I, th I think the whole question about data is, is, is fascinating, you know, and it's a big, big question, this. Um, um, data informs, creativity imagines. Mm. And I think... You know, you've got to remember what data does. You know, it informs, it, it gets knowledge. You know, this is going on, that's going on. But creativity imagines. Uh, imagination drives creativity. So 
you've got to have both of the, to a certain extent both of those things but very interesting actually and it depends on how and where you use it so if you think about all of the great companies none of them were built on data none of them you know james dyson didn't have data to say you know people want a bagless uh, vacuum cleaner uh, they don't like the way the other ones suck um, Steve Jobs would tell you that, you know, the iPhone, nobody said, I want something bigger. They all wanted something smaller. Uh, Elon Musk, you know, what he's done, he's not built anything on data. He's built it on intuition. So you have to decide, where am I? What am I doing? Am I just sustaining a brand at the moment? Or am I trying to think of something completely different? So how you use the data, where you use the data is fundamentally important. But I think, you know, it, I, I think we've we've become obsessed with it. And I think, um, you know, we've got to sort of tame it to a certain extent and go, yeah, it's interesting. It's going to inform me. I mean, you know, <clears throat> there was no, you know, when Jeff Bezos set up Amazon, there was no data to say this is what people wanted. He said, I think I could sell books like this. Yes, later on, he's used a huge amount of data to go, those books are selling, those ones aren't, that's doing that. And then you use data. I mean, supermarkets use it on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you're imagining the future, mm -hmm. when you're if that's where you're going, then I'm not sure what data is going to tell you. It's just going to maybe inhibit you. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. And that's why I think you've got to understand where it has value and why we should be using it. And of course, I love the fact that we now call it big data, don't we? It's no longer data anymore. It's big data. Oh, suddenly it's all more important. No, it's not. You know, and it's been around for thousands of years. You know, I always say, you know, that one of the greatest stories ever told. You know, the nativity came out of data collection, didn't it? You know, they'd all gone to register for the uh, the census and <laughs> so couldn't find, couldn't, you know. I mean, it wasn't it, you know, kind of, you know, I mean, <laughs> I always think it's funny, you know, I always think it's funny about religion, isn't it? I mean, if it was the son of God, why didn't God tell Joseph? You know, you better get on to booking.com because there are going to be a lot of people, you'll need a hotel room. And it, it didn't, did it? You know, I feel a bit, bit lack of God to inform, you know, Joseph that his son is going to be now born in a bloody stable because he failed to book a hotel room. Jesus, what are you doing? Uh, that's a good name. Let's call him Jesus. I think. Uh, anyway, sorry, oh, I, 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 I go on with things like that. But I, so I think it's understanding data, understanding how and where to use it. Uh, yeah. what value it has yeah yeah bang on no it, it, it it's that thing I, I you know even the you know some of the folks who are you know major proponents of strategy uh you know you look at uh mark ritson for example you know as asking him uh not too long ago because you know it's diagnosis strategy and tactics you know you understand the market you understand what you want to say to them and then you go out to the market and they asked him whether there was a um there was a founder's prerogative, you know, on these things, you know, there was just that little bit of magic that those little moments where you're like, you know, I'm going to do this because I'm going to do this, not because, um, you know, because the data tells me. And he went, yeah, of course there is, you know, and it's a very human thing. It's, 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 it's exactly that. Um, I'll, it, there's a lovely follow on question here, actually, from Baz. Um, who is the guy who who built our branding? So for those of you in the marketing, oh, lovely! I love that. Yeah, yeah. Who don't know? You've just made his day, honestly. Uh, but for those of you who don't oh, know, it's just great, Baz. Well done. I like it. <laughs> and positive, uh, positive smile. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Baz says uh, focus groups hated the Cadbury's Gorilla advert, um, but the audience loved it. In a data-driven world, so following on from the last question, uh, what's your advice to get stubborn clients to ignore data that could be very misleading, given the Cadbury's example? Yeah, it's it's something that you know we had to live with constantly, uh, and you're and the trouble there is you're you're trying to get people to imagine something and imagine how different that's going to feel when they see it for 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 real. And data is of absolutely no use whatsoever. It'll just drive you to conformity. There, there, I'm sorry, I don't have a magic solution to it. I suffered it throughout my career. I mean, Vorsprung Dirk Technik, the research came back and said, don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, I had a client who said, but we are German, so let's admit to it. The uh, 501 campaign, uh, when uh, Levi's researched the actual product, the 501, kids hated it. 
Mm. Buttons? Why would I want buttons? I mean, zips are much more more convenient. They 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 couldn't envisage how it could be. So you have that all the time. And in fact, the Direct commercial didn't research very well. It was kind of fairly average. But the client, well, we've got nothing else. You've got to put it on air. Uh, and so you know, you come across this all the time. The only you know, if you read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. He kind of explains why all that research doesn't work. And I, I think all you can do is just say to a client, look, you're going to put this in front of people. They aren't going to know how to, to, to judge it. And what they're going to do is give you rational reasons, not emotional reasons, um, because you're asking them to be rational when, in fact, they're emotional human beings. And they don't know how to tap into that in terms of answering questionnaires. But it, it's a problem that we had throughout our career. And I, and I see no solution to it. It's just fire that client and go and work with one who wants to be a bit more daring, you know. That's it. Sorry. Fine. That wasn't Fine. that much helpful, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you know, sometimes it's the truth, you know, and, and we've had yeah, plenty of cases over the course of time where the answer has been. Yeah, the other funny, I'll tell a very funny story. We worked with Cadbury's who were, at that time, lovely people, but terrible. They were lovely people, but they, they just researched good morning, you know. And, and we were running a this is like the early 90s and we were running a a campaign for a chocolate bar called boost and the great thing it was on radio and i i kept getting the account member come to me and say john we need some more scripts moving my own fine and i said wait a minute we've just written six you need another six he said well we, we are now the biggest advertiser on radio and the brilliant thing we were spending something like at that time three million per annum on radio. And of course, what was brilliant about radio is nobody researches the script. <laughs> nobody did any research, even though they were spending three billion. And so I said to them, whatever you do, don't try and get them to move on to television. Let's stay with radio because, and we were right, they got into DNA D and we did, you know, it was, a, it was for um, a, a chocolate bar called Boost and it was slightly rippled with a flat underside. I always remember the line. It was a great, great line. And, and, but nobody was researching it because, well, you don't research radio, do you? So they just went out and the climate would go, oh, yeah, okay. And uh, it was uh, Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer. And it was a great, great campaign. And I loved it. So get, get your client onto radio. <laughs> do something very funny. They won't research it. <laughs> <laughs> that's fabulous. I mean, that's that's the takeaway from today's session. If there are, are, are any of, of, of today, it's been, a, yeah, just get your client on radio. Uh, that's the solution. <laughs> um, uh, love it. We, 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 uh, you know, the hour has flown by, uh, John. Uh, thank you. Well, love so talking much. to you. <laughs> well, I really appreciate it. And, 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 you know, it's been really, really fabulous. And, and thank you uh, to everyone in the community as well for your fabulous questions and, and the chat going yeah, on. Yeah, great. Um, it's, and it's... and if you can, I mean, uh, seriously, this is where I do do a bit of a sell. If you, if you can go on and look at what we're doing on the business of creativity, it'll help you. And maybe you should sell it to your clients uh, because it will help them understand how to buy great ads. 100%. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure to link that in the follow-up email. That's great. All today. right. Well, lovely talking to you all. And, and keep right. fighting the great fight. You know, keep <laughs> fighting that creative fight. We need it. We need it. That's fabulous. Absolutely lovely. fabulous. All right. Thank you. Cheers, John. Cheers. Lovely talking to you. I'm going to go now. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Great stuff. Okay. All right. Talk Bye again now. soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.